Hello to all of our audience and welcome uh, to the BAPRAS B First BBA and Research Africa um, webinar on hypermetabolism. I think that today will be an absolutely exciting day to learn about everything related to this fantastic subspecialty within burn care. Before I introduce my distinguished audience and the format of the meeting, I'd like a few housekeeping notes. First of all, this meeting is going to be recorded and will be available on both YouTube and the Be First uh, website afterwards. Uh, we will be awarding attendance certificates and that will be sent to you by the end of uh, next week. I'd like to remind all of you to submit your questions through the Q&A function of your screen and not the chat, because if not, we will not guarantee that questions uh, within the chat box will be answered. Uh, this is a live webinar in which clinical pictures will be shown. I'd like to ask you not to record these. Okay, you can amend your screen to show a speaker view or gallery view, depending on your preference. After that, I'd like to introduce my distinguished audience. We have got an incredible international and UK faculty that I'm sure will be excited to share the knowledge and experience on this fantastic subspecialty with you. Our international audience includes, include Dr. Tanvir uh, Ahmed, uh, who is a consultant plastic surgeon in Bangladesh, Dr. Raja Shanmugakrishnan, a plastic surgeon in Ganga, India, Dr. Bill Hughes, the director of the Jefferson Burn Center in uh, Philadelphia, USA, and a number of colleagues from the UK that include uh, Natasha Kershaw, a senior dietitian from the Broomfields unit in Essex, Joe Hussey, consultant adult in pediatric anesthesiology with a significant interest in burn critical care medicine, Sarah Smiles, a physiotherapy consultant also at Broomfield, and my nursing colleagues, Nicole Lee, a senior nurse and a key figure in the London and Southeast Burn Network. We're also privileged to count today, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest a speaker today, uh, a longtime personal friend and a proud and a pride uh, to have, his, uh, to have uh, him joining today, Professor Mark Jeski from the University of Toronto. Professor Mark Jeski is the director of the Ross Tilly Burn Center, Sunnybrook. He's the chair in burn research and a senior scientist. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Jeski and also to share this webinar in the co-chair uh, function with my colleague, Oren uh, Shelley. And I also like to um, thank my colleagues, Nadim Kwaja and Stuart Watson for their support during this session. Professor Mark Jeski, we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jorge. Thank you everybody for the, the honor of presenting today and to uh, talk about my favorite topic, which is uh, hypermetabolism. And uh, I would like to, my, the talk is structured and I uh, hope you can see all my screen. It structures as such, I would like to give you a little bit of the pathophysiologic and the biochemical changes in hypermetabolism just as a but the state of the art, what do we know? And then I would like to focus on the key elements, how to go about and how to treat hypermetabolism. Um, first of all, oh, not advancing. Why is it not advancing? There you go. Just for us, I think it's a very impressive start always to remember, to keep in mind why we're here. So we basically know in terms of a global problem that we have the equivalent of 30,000 people being burned every single day. And every three minutes, somebody succumbs from a burn injury, which is a staggering number. And I think we as burn care providers understand the importance, but often we are forgotten and burn is not considered as a major important aspect in terms of the global injuries, but it clearly is. As we all are aware of, over the years from the 1940s to the 2010s and 2020s, we made significant improvements um, in terms of uh, outcomes in terms of the LD50 and the burn injuries. And you can see here early excision, the burn units, ICU care made a big difference in the outcome of burn patients. But if we now ask ourselves where we stand, and we did this study a couple of years ago to ask ourselves, why do patients still die? And you can see in the studies, we did a 230 uh, patient enrollment and looked at mortality. When do they die? What do they die of? You can see here at the bottom of my table, 
that we still have a significant of patients that are being burned dying from injuries, and it is associated with moth, sepsis, and infections. And these are the main contributors, and this is lightening this up. So when we divide the Kaplan-Meier survival curve, as you can see here, you can see clearly there seem to be phases of why patients die and when patients die. And it was very important for us when we did this exercise to then look what happens in these phases. And now this leads me to for phases of burn survival, life or death. And now you, you can see clearly why hypermetabolism is one of our focus because hypermetabolism is playing a role in every single phase. Hypermetabolism seems to be therefore central for survival of burn patients. And well, what is hypermetabolism? We all know that everybody has a metabolic demand. And we all know that a burn patient after, over a certain burn size has an increased metabolic demand in terms of uh, nutrition and protein delivery and so forth. We call it, when we measure it, call it the resting metabolic rate. And this is an older figure. And you can see here, we used to have high metabolic demands and resting energy expenditure more than any other disease. And you can see this uh, almost two to 300% increase in the metabolic demand. This is more acute data in pediatric patients. And you see, we made a significant improvement in terms of our, our predicted RE, so our, our hypermetabolic response. We, we brought this down, but we still have a significant uh, metabolic response after burn. And when we now go into and thought, think about it, what causes this? And I think this is essential work from Dr. Pruitt and Dr. Herndon clearly showing that we have a significant increase in urine cortisol and catecholamines uh, immediately after burn and they persist. And I will show you a little bit later, they're not only persisting through acute hospitalization, but even longer so. So what do these stress hormones that are clearly there for fight or flight responses then do? They go and activate particularly the catecholamines to uh, various receptors. And you can see here, all these symptoms seem very similar to what we observe in our patients. We do have this hyperdynamic circulation, tachycardia, muscle catabolism, lipolysis, hyperglycemia, insulin resistance. So all of this is mediated through catecholamines or stimulated immediately after burn. And when you look at the physiology, I'm sure you are, these data uh, is reflected in your clinical observations. You can see cardiac output is increased for a significant long, uh, period of time. The heart rate, particularly in kids, is sometimes double to triple what they should be predicted, as well as the cardiac index. And it's not significantly improving throughout hospitalization. So hypermetabolism involves the cardiacolamine-induced stress, going to your uh, metabolic demand, your heart, as well as it causes massive, vast uh, inflammatory cytokines that are here highlighted. I don't want to go in detail into them, but these cytokines are mediators that causes the stress to be persistent and has downstream many, many detrimental uh, effects. And you can see in these figures, they are increased for a prolonged period of time. And some of them like IL-6, a major metabolic mediator is thousandfold increase and that's persisting so. So these cytokines lead to a problem. It's not only uh, detrimental for your organ function, it also affects obviously your met metabolism and your immune system. And that is another issue. So we, we know that our burn patients are uh, immunocompromised. We have decreased neutrophils, our T cells don't work, the leukocyte killing is not functioning, the macrophages are changing. So our entire immune system is completely shut down, leading to massive opportunistic infections such as fungi or other, uh, path uh, other microbiology. So in addition, not only affecting your immune system, your bone marrow, your heart, your, your cardiac system, we know that your liver due to lipolysis is massively increased, two to 300%. And we are aware of the central function of the liver, it's coagulation function, immune function, metabolic function. Recently, it was delineated that the liver and the adipose tissue are your key metabolic organs regulating, uh, regulating the meta metabolic response after burn and after trauma. And you have a dysfunctional liver, and you can see in this autopsy, uh, fully infiltrated of fat. And you can see here the increase in size. Well, ultimately, where does the energy come from? And this is a major problem because it does come from the muscle. And the muscle um, is our major mobilization aspect. It is our, our source that keeps us going and uh, provides a short acting next to glucose, uh, short acting energy that gives us the boost when we want to escape a stress situation. Well. The issue is, and again, sentinel work by Dr. Herndon, 
you can see that in the burn patient, these are stable isotope infusion looking at muscle metabolism. Our synthesis is not to making the problem is not as much the problem. Our breakdown, this is the normal range. And you can see we break down double to triple the amount what we should be doing. And that basically results in massive muscle catabolism. You don't make any muscle protein for weeks and months. And that is an issue because this is the, not providing the sources. We can mobilize our patients. They're becoming prone to, in, to various out, bad outcomes. And they're weak and their weakness persists. So it's not only the structural loss, it's also the weakness that persists. And when you look at the changes in your body in a big burn, what happens, even if we do everything right, you can see we lose nowadays two to 5%, which is pretty good, I, I would say, but you have about four to 8% of lean body mass loss, which is tremendous. Bone mineral content, bone mineral density are decreased, but your fat, and that is an issue. And we can talk about it later. This depends on nutrition. You really get into trouble when you have too much fat growing. And that is the only thing that is anabolic is some sort of like fat. And this I just showed the strength is decreased. Just briefly, if you look at this busy uh, slide though, but it is very fascinating to understand that our hypermetabolic response does not last only for this up to discharge, which would be here. It lasts up to years and years to come. No IP, epinephrine, cortisone, cortisol, they all remain elevated three to four to five years after the burn injury, even when we healed and left the hospital. So our acute phase is not the limiting factor for hyper metabolism. And you can see REEs, changes in your liver, changes in your body, in your bone, everywhere, your heart rate, everything is affected for three to five years after burn. So hyper metabolism clearly is a problem. And very fascinatingly so, when we looked at the, at the genome in leukocytes, you can see there is a clustering of 585 patients. What is very striking is that your genome changes and it's persistently changed in this uh, prototypical cell where you see reds are being upregulated genes and they may change for years to come. So summarizing what I tried to, I tried to convince you is that hypermetabolism is important and it's very complex. And we've been studying it for some time. I've been personally studying it for over 20 years and I still learn a lot and we still don't understand the complexity of that entire response. And recently, I would just like to delineate, we learned about this axis, the adipose tissue and the liver. And this is something we are currently investigating because it seems that the adipose tissue with a phenomenon called browning has modulating and mediating functions for hypermetabolism. And this is something we never ever paid attention to, which I believe is a big mistake. And we're trying to understand what's happening here. Say, well, now I, I've seen the, the physiology of hypermetabolism, but why is it important? And this study by Dr. Denling and, and Chang in shock clearly shows you when you lose 10% of your lean body mass, you have impaired immune function already. 20% wound healing is disrupted and not functioning. 30% of your body mass, you get your pressure sores, pneumonias, and inc increased infection. 40%, you will not survive the injury. Therefore, there is a clear indication that we need to do something about hypermetabolism, not only short, but you can see here long-term as well, because this cachectic response is so devastating and it vast. It is really a storm that causes patients to be debilitated. So what does that mean? What can we do about it? And then uh, the last uh, eight, nine minutes, and I, I'm still good on time, Dr. Villapalas, I would like to delineate what can we do and show you some evidence about the anabolic and anti-catabolic agent. This is a key slide though. I think four aspects really that everybody hopefully can accomplish in their, in their practices can attenuate hypermetabolism. First, you have to go, this is muscle metabolism. If you excise the burn early, you attenuate hypermetabolism. This is an inflammatory driven aspect how to improve muscle catabolism is to go to the ore within the 20, first 24 to 72 hours. Second, when you look behind it, the temperature in the room as well as in the ore has to be high. This is, these were studies by Dr. Herndon in the 70s and 80s. And to this day, it holds true. Your room has to be warm, unpleasant for the surgeon and the team, good for the patient. And this includes the ore. And even pre-warming is, is an aspect that we need to maybe be very mindful of. Thirdly, adequate nutrition. You need to feed the patient adequately. The, what we, Dr. Hart showed is actually quite interesting. If you basically feed high fats, you do not attenuate the, the catabolism. If you feed high glucose, 
you actually get fatty infiltration. So there is an ideal balance where and it's right in the middle. So you need to be feeding more proteins, amino acids, and glucose rather than fats in order to have an anabolic response. That's very important. It has to be adequate. And lastly, it is exercise. The earlier you exercise the patient and mobilize the patient, the better it is to attenuate hypermetabolism. I mean, these are four key elements I think that we somewhat can implement in our practice uh, hopefully quite reasonably well. So what else can we do? As you know, there are many things being described and overall there seems to be uh, various approaches that have an effect on hypermetabolism and they are listed here. And I, for the, for the purpose of time and the purpose of interest and what I believe I focused on four. Um, and the first one will be obviously propanolol. And we're all aware of this study. I don't know, I need to go into many details of the study. We know that Dr. Herner published in uh, 2001 uh, it was 12 and 12 about uh, propanolol being given to significant burn patients. Their body surface area was uh, tremendously burned. And what he did, they administered propanolol at bedsides to really decrease the heart rate by approximately 20%, which you can see here in figure A. Then looking at uh, blood pressure that was not affected because it was constantly given at from the bedside aspect. And then looking at muscle catabolism. And you can see here, while the control group was still catabolic two weeks in, the propanolol group actually became anabolic. And this data then was, oops. Oops, what's happening now? Why, what's happening? I'm sorry. Um, and uh, my, 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 there's something weird is happening. We, we, can, see you, we can see your screen, okay, Mark, oh, and we thank can you. hear you. I'm, I'm sorry that it really, uh, my computer acted up, uh, sensitive. Um, and this is unpublished data, just to show you a little bit what the current evidence is uh, for propanolol. We did this trial um, and this is a still an ongoing trial and again, unpublished, but you see a large randomized trial. You see the characteristics um, of our trial there, particularly the concerns about uh, Bruno pneumonia and so forth. That was not present, but what is very important for you who take care of kids, it seemed very evident that the dosing to have your drop of 20% in your heart rate, uh, the dosing has to increase from one milligram per kilogram per day to basically four milligram per kilogram per day. That is uh, achieving because there seems to be a certain tachyphylaxis. And this is where you improve your rate pressure product as well as it gives you indication that you hopefully attenuate your hypermetabolic response. And in terms of outcome, the concerns about ARDS, actually it was uh, better in propanolol patients, as well as pneumonia, as well as the infection aspect. Uh, we didn't look at mortality, and I would be cautious to look at the, that aspect, but you can clearly see that propanolol has a beneficial effect on the immune system, on the meta metabolic aspects, as well as various others. You may say, well, pediatrics, it's, uh, that's really not all the population. What about adults? And we know there is a large trial ongoing. And this is data from our GLU grant that we actually looked at uh, in adult patients. And you can see here that the signal for survival in big burns who were on propanolol is significantly improved. So control patients had a higher mortality. This is a survival graph, not a mortality graph. You can see that uh, the propanolol patients had a, better had a better survival. And the dosing I would recommend uh, as current as relatively safe is 10 milligram QID PO or NG. And then you need to assess your heart rate daily at 6 a.m. And then once you assess that you need to adjust your dosing, you can go up to 20, 30, 40, 50. But this is a safe way of restoring and blocking the catecholamine response. Next is oxandrolone. And one of the best, I think, easiest um, anabolic agents, synthetic testosterone, we know this, used in various indications. And uh, to summarize it, you can see that oxandrolone really reverses the catabolic response here in lean body mass. It is not so much fat driven, so it's really muscle driven that when you give oxandrolone, you have mainly a muscle effect. And you can see here, it is mainly the synthetic rate that is affected and the net balance that's affected when you give oxandrolone, relatively safe, very few side effects, and it not only increases the, your, your, your structural aspect, it also increases your strength, which is highly beneficial, and you can give it long term. And we did recently a meta-analysis and looking at all the trials that are out there, it was one of our medical students on our own, on, from our group. And you see here, 
something that we didn't really expect, but there is a slight even signal towards improved survival with Oxemplon. But what is more important is the uh, hospital length of stay is significantly short. I think that's very important for us to, to indicate oxandrolone is a safe agent that can, uh, given, uh, can given orally to basically improve length of stay, wound healing, and get you out of the hospital orally, as well as improve muscle mass. And here are the other significances that you can see. And there was, I put the reference in there, it was recently published, and you can uh, go back and read if you wish. Something that really is dear to my heart, and we published this in 2010, is insulin. And what does insulin do? Insulin, summarizing, it has a, it has a profound effect on organ function and the hypermetabolic response. It, pre, it pre, uh, improves renal function, it improves liver function, it improves our overall uh, organ functions, and it is supposed to be anabolic. And when we looked again at body mass changes, we used by DEXA, you can see we have some fat and we can see you can see we have some lean body mass as well as body mass increases. So insulin is a bit different to propelnol, anti-catabolic, oxandron anabolic. Insulin has a plethora of effects that seems to me very beneficial. And uh, how much insulin do you need to give? We do not need to go really, really tight. Uh, we did an analysis of 300,000 glucose measurements and found that 130 milligrams a day is the target you should shoot for. So that's the insulin dose you should be given in a patient because why? You avoid hypoglycemia. Because if you have hypoglycemic patients, you can see if you have two episodes of hypoglycemia, your mort mort mortality is significantly worse than if you do not. So you need to be very careful. And I understand the challenges of giving insulin on an ongoing basis, a constant infusion. Uh, that's very difficult, but you have to avoid hypoglycemia and burn. So insulin is beneficial without the effects of hypoglycemia. You have to target this. This led us to investigate a, a drug called metformin because we hypothesized it's safe and it's not causing hypoglycemia. And you see here, it's a small study only. We published in surgery a couple of years ago. We are enrolling more patients for that and uh, waiting for a large uh, aspect of the trial. And no difference in mortality were not to be expected. No differences in major clinical outcome, but it was very interesting that we have no renal failure in our metformin patients. And that we actually have any signals that pneumonias as well as bacteremias and wound infections were significantly decreased. What does it do to your glucose? You can see here, we can safely titrate glucose with metformin administration without causing hypoglycemia because there was a 16% in our insulin group and only less than 2% in our metformin group. And is it anabolic? Well, yes, it is. Uh, we, I didn't put the DEXA data up for, for time's sake, but you can see here what we have is a massive improvement of our indices for insulin resistance and hypermetabolism as well as cytokine. So it has an effect on hypermetabolism. It has a profound effect on lipolysis. And actually it's regenerative for various uh, organs such as mitochondria, ER, liver, and so forth. So I'm a, I'm a bit inv investigational, but I think metformin is a relatively safe drug uh, that is available worldwide. So if you summarize in this little slide, what's available, growth hormone right now is very restrictive. I would not recommend it. Insulin has the challenge of hypoglycemia. IGF-1 has been given, but has various side effects, hypoglycemia, you know, neuropathies, and so forth. Oxandrolone has the rare side effect of hirsutism, as well as has some liver enzyme elevation, which you can just simply stop. Propelnol, we did not see the bronchospasm. It has, in adults, has the aspect of hypotension uh, that is a little bit higher than 1%. This is mainly in kids. Metformin lactic acidosis. So we have over 150 patients, and I have yet to observe lactic acidosis. I didn't see it in our patient. The literature says 2 to 3%. So when you look at cost, I think it's pretty clear that you really, um, the cheaper, the better, in my opinion. And you can see here, metformin is profoundly cheap. Propelnol is very cheap. Uh, Oxandrolone is, is medium there, but I think the price is coming down. So to me, this is a clear indication of what is available, what can be done, and uh, what is out um, next to our four uh, measurements, what I indicated. And I'm happy to answer questions, but uh, I would like to end by thanking the team. I thinking this is our, this is our, if you haven't seen this, is Sunnybrook, the burn center is here under the clock tower, the floor is burn center. Lovely Toronto, please visit anytime. I'm happy to uh, welcome you and show you around and uh, show you how our lovely friends is. So anyway, thanks very much for your attention and uh, the invitation. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Jeschke. That was an absolutely superb lecture, uh, giving us basically as key points on the control of hypermetabolism. Um, in order basically as to open the debate, I'd like to ask you uh, a number of questions. And I have basically several stems. The first one basically that I'd like to ask you is, uh, you have showed some incredible data, but uh, uh, on the pharmacological control of hypermetabolism. If we can translate hypermetabolism control to our colleagues in less resourced environments, what could be the minimum set of interventions that can be applied worldwide, irrespective of resource, rich or not, to control hypermetabolism? And my second question is a question that has come around live, is what would be the ideal time to start propanolol and when? Thank you, Professor Jeshka. Okay. Well, thank you for the question. So the uh, what I practice, I'm not sure there is an ideal time. And again, we are waiting for the large trial that was funded by the military in North America uh, to actually see does propanol have a survival benefit in adult patients. And I understand the complexity in adults. I have the same probably issues what everybody has. Pediatric patients are beautifully controlled with propanol. It's challenging in adults and even more so in the elderly. I personally don't start propanol until I have the first trip to the OR. We resuscitate. We go to the OR 24 to 72 hours. It's our practice, usually around 24 to 48. The bride, patient has stabilized, then becomes tachycardic, then I start. I believe at the beginning, when a patient is in the in the, in the EP phase, it is really, he needs his tachycardia. He needs a stress response in his first 72 hours. You need your stress or you're not going to survive. So I wait until the patients come out of this initial stress response and then uh, I start propound on. I give it 10 milligrams QID and GPO, whatever is available. And then I, we reassess the heart rate at 6 a.m. and then adjust the dosing. Do we need to go up or down? Make sure that we don't have drops in blood pressure. The map, map is fine. And we really use the heart rate as an indicator for how much uh, propound to give. The second question, Jorge, I, I really think whatever is available, that's why I delineate it. I think early excision and grafting is the evidence is very clear. It's not only hypermetabolism, it is for bleeding, it is infection prevention, it is an aspect that we should consider doing um, to re decrease hypermetabolism. Adequate nutrition to feed as early as possible, PO and G and J, whatever is the preference, I think to eat immediate, to feed actually when you admitted a patient. I feed immediately when a patient comes through the door, uh, we admit, we do our necessary interventions, we start feeding. I think that's very important. Mobilization. We, are, we have that tendency to say, oh, patient is sick, don't mobilize him. He doesn't want to be out of bed. Mobilize the patient, get him out of bed immediately, as early as possible. And we can have a discussion how long it takes grafts to ad adhere to be safe to be mobilized. Right? We have a certain aspect about this. But as your practice is, whatever your time you wait, you have your graft adhere and, um, and heal, then mobilize. Or you put a negative pressure on to mobilize early. So there are various aspects. And then lastly, you just need to sweat. If you don't sweat in the OR and sweat in the patient's room, you'd clearly have missed uh, the, the easiest treatment, which is keep the environment warm. And uh, I think these four, four aspects, a lot of us can implement. And then whatever you have, I think oxandrolone is globally pretty distributed. For example, in metformin, they don't require intensive oversight like insulin or propanol. They're not as difficult to administer. Right, they're easy because oxandrolone, you just see, do you have realization or some elevation of liver enzymes as well as metformin? You just uh, poke once a day to see his blood glucose okay and you can give it. And metformin has been shown to be anabolic. Um, so it's very straightforward to administer these agents. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'd like basically as now to start um, our clinical cases uh, that will actually hopefully elicit this uh, discussion with our panel, um, I may, I'm going to ask my co-chair, Oren Shelley, to uh, get the slides on. Thank you very much. The first case uh, that uh, uh, I would like to uh, tell you about is uh, the case of a six-year-old girl with a 50% total body surface area burn with a scalding, with potential contaminated wounds that have been treated with traditional medicine re remedies that arrive in a delayed fashion to uh, a definitive facility and that develops septic shock potentially or aggravated by burn conversion, okay? And that burn conversion requires debridement and grafting that leads to uh, graft loss, 
Professor Jeschke has uh, raised a number of issues that I think will undoubtedly elicit discussion. I'd like first to ask uh, my colleague uh, Tanvir Ahmed to give us his views on how would he proceed with this case in order to limit the effects of hypermetabolism. Tanvir, may I have your views, please? Yeah, thank you. Actually, as you know, in our country, uh, we are overburdened with the burnt cases and we used to receive a lot of cases. So uh, due to the lack of uh, resources, we used to basically focus on uh, because they, mostly they are the under resuscitated in our uh, setting. So we used to start the resuscitation first. Then we used to uh, mm -hmm. start with a warm saline and keep the patient warm. Though our environment is a uh, 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 tropical country, but the uh, if we infuse the saline, those are really cold and uh, actually decreases the core temperature. So we now using the warm salines. And then uh, we used to go for the, as it is a 50% uh, burn, so we straight away go for the uh, nasogastric tubes. And we used to start the NG feeding. And as our facilities are very limited, so we can do the early accession. Rather, we focus on the, uh, uh, the rapid change of dressings. And actually, we start the empirical antibiotics due to our uh, environment. So in this way, we actually start our uh, things, but we don't have any uh, uh, anabolic hormones uh, uh, available in our country, but we are not uh, at this moment using the propanol. Thank you very much, Tanvir. Um, I think that Professor Jeschke has introduced an, an extremely uh, uh, interesting group of minimal set of interventions. I'd like to ask at this stage my colleague Natasha Kershaw, senior dietitian uh, at Broomfield, what would be her strategies regarding the management of nutrition uh, in this complex patient? Natasha. I think um, the potential success of nutritional management of this patient um, would first, it would be those first crucial 24 to 48 hours after the admission that's going to set precedent of how successful we can be later. Um, so certainly, as Professor Mark was uh, discussing, that ebb phase um, can be a really crucial time. So this child has already been delayed uh, in their presentation. So really, they need to be medically stabilized. They need to have an adequate resuscitation. Because if you uh, are under resuscitated in that first part, then I would have concerns to do with the hyperperfusion of the gut. And if your gut becomes stressed, and it in itself is going to become a cytokine generating organ, um, and it's also going to become a high risk area for feeding because when the gut becomes uh, either hyperperfused or it might become uh, edematous and therefore it will have problems with dysmotility later, even once we start trying to feed, you might find there'll be issues with feed tolerance um, and gaining access. So it'd be crucial for the early medical management to get the patient stable. And then in the ebb phase, I would say less is more. So it'd be something sort of trickle fed to provide protection to the gut, first pass metabolism for the enterocytes. And then once they're stable after a couple of days, then increasing up to something that would meet their estimated nutritional requirements, wherever that might be, whether that be lucky enough to be indirect calorimetry, but more likely to be something like an estimated uh, requirement from sort of perhaps a Galveston equation um, and calculating their sort of metabolic needs that way. Thank you very much, Natasha. That is a fantastic uh, uh, answer. Uh, before I uh, pass the button uh, to my colleague, Oren Shelley, I'd like to uh, bring Dr. Raja Savapathy into the question and ask, uh, uh, Raja, I have had some very interesting point of, of use of Tanvir that uh, highlight the potential uh, limitation in controlling hypermetabolism due to either resources or availability of pharmacological intervention. What are your, uh, what is your experience in your unit and what are your strategies to control hypermetabolism um, in your practice? Thank you. I think um, definitely we do have some uh, limitations and, and I think one of the most uh, important limitations that we have in our country is that we have a lot, lot of these multi-drug resistant organisms. So, you know, so uh, it, the thing is that you need to start on a higher level of antibiotics when compared to what is done in the West. I think that is one thing is over there. And I think from the from the experience of the past three years that I'm there in, in India, what is there is that 
uh, if you miss the very early opportunities, then the, the, the patient is in sepsis with multidrug resistant organisms, then it becomes very, very difficult for us to uh, treat these uh, patients. So I think that uh, the, 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 the first opportunity is the best opportunity. And many times we miss it, we don't really do well. And I think uh, that is uh, that is uh, that is the uh, that is a big problem that we have. Um, Can I ask? Sorry, sir. Oh no, apologies. Um, I, I was going to ask a, a question back to Mark. You, you've raised some uh, very good uh, points there, um, Raja. Uh, Mark, could I ask you? And for the, the cases you presented, we spoke a lot of, or you spoke about the early uh, excision and the early total excision. Um, do you have a uh, way to uh, manage a patient or advice to a patient that comes in with a, a delay in presentation where they've already gone through several uh, parts of their, their, their burn injury and are now uh, have lost protein and so forth and, and encountering the problems that Raj has discussed? Yeah, well, we we do not uh, see them here uh, in Toronto as much because we are we have an easy referral system, an easier, more centralized referral system like what many other countries do have. But we've seen them uh, in my previous life a lot. They were delayed, and um, that is a challenge to have delayed uh, patients coming that are under resuscitated or even probably in, when you have fifty percent graft loss, you're probably infected or septic. Um, and that that definitely is is uh, indicative of an increased hypermetabolism. We do know that septic patients, uh, you know, hypermetabolism induces the immune dysfunction. But we also know that a septic patient has an increased hypermetabolism. I, I think the approach would be to go to the OR and clean up. And if you have cadaver skin or other graft, that's uh, probably in, in the, a way of cleaning it up and grafting it and get the patient critically uh, from a critical care aspect under control. And then uh, try to, once you have them stable, organs are functioning, then you can start with uh, your interventions uh, to, to treat him from a critical care aspect, metabolic aspect, and then start subsequent autographing. But these delays cases, they are not very easy. And I remember probably Jorge will share this with me when we, we admitted several of those. And they are either really, really ill and uh, they, 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 they're very difficult to treat and to get them to pull them through to these responses is not easy, for sure not. So anybody who's treating those, uh, you know, that is a tough case to do. But I, my recommendation is stabilize the patient. Try to get the infected grafts off. Do critical care as much as you can, resuscitate, maintain organ function, and then start treating inflammation, metabolism, immune system, and grafting. That is a fantastic response, uh, uh, Mark. Um, I, I'd like to bring uh, just uh, a different direction or an additional direction into this uh, uh, fabulous debate, which is um, we have uh, spoken about the importance of exercise uh, and physiotherapy into the management uh, of, uh, of these patients. I may ask, uh, bring uh, Sarah Smiles uh, into the debate and ask her, uh, Sarah, mobilization, respiratory therapy, and physiotherapy of these patients combined uh, to produce a decrease in catabolism. What are your views, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a difficult case because of the delayed presentation, as we've heard already. Um, I agree with Mark. I think the, the sooner you get organs functioning, the quicker you can then start some meaningful active exercise. Um, while you've got a critically ill patient attached to a ventilator, um, it's, it's, you can't get active exercise done I I in a meaningful way. You need the patient to be awake and cooperative. So with this kind of patient, um, if, if you can get the patients, you know, stabilized um, off the ventilator and then as soon as possible, as soon as that patient is awake, you need to start active exercise straight away. Now, there are uh, uh, lots of different criteria as to what is safe to do in intensive care and what is not safe to do in, in terms of in-bed and out-of-bed exercise. Um, and, and, and this is absolutely fine and, and easy to, um, uh, to understand. But I think the, the, the crux of it is you need active exercise as soon as possible. Um, with this kind of patient, we've seen that 
you're going to lose at least two to four percent of muscle ma muscle mass every day through critical illness, intensive care weakness. But on top of that, we've got the hypermetabolic response, which is going to add in a, in a huge way. So um, with ch this is a child. So with this sort of child, you know, we're going to, need to have to educate the parents to get involved here, to encourage the child to get moving give really good analgesia first before we start any active exercise. If it hurts, the kid's not going to want to do it and the family are not going to want to see their child going through any pain either. So I think the top tip there is stabilize the patient, active exercise as soon as the patient is awake. That can be in the bed, out the bed as soon as possible. Weight bearing is fantastic. So get them up on the feet. Um, and as I say, education and reassurance to the family, this is going to hurt, but we've got painkillers. There's no, there's no such thing as pain-free exercise, but this, we understand we're going to be giving you these painkillers before the exercise and, and the benefits are massive. So it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things that uh, good education, good analgesia, and as early as you can. With that in mind, um, I think that there are, and you, you have actually raised a number of points, uh, Sarah. I think uh, there's definitely no... Uh, um, no gain without the pain of, of exercise. But I feel that in this case, there's no doubt that the limitations that can have, that the patient can have because of the burn conversion and the failure of the grafting can bring uh, a number of uh, uh, problems uh, to uh, facilitate ultimate uh, uh, outcome. I'd like to bring Bill uh, Hughes into uh, the conversation and ask Bill, uh, taking into consideration that you have got a pediatric patient that is debilitated in septic shock and with failed grafts already, um, what would be or what would have been the ideal time for this patient to go to the operating theater? And would you have covered her with grafts immediately? Can I have your views, please? Uh, well, I think the ideal time definitely would be within the first 72 hours from the time of the injury and getting such a late presentation. As we all know, kids when they're sick really don't want to eat eat well either. So that you know that, that by this point has not gotten the nutrition. I, I think with uh, this patient, as mentioned earlier, I, I don't know if I would graft immediately, especially somebody who, who is in shock because number one, you know, your grafts aren't going to do well because of the shock and because of the decreased nutrition. But more importantly, you're, you're making a new wound with that donor site that also needs to heal, which is adding to, to further stress and probably that wound may not heal and even get infected to, to make matters even worse. So I think uh, with, uh, with this patient, definitely probably would have excised and do some type of, of temporary coverage, uh, get control of the sepsis. And of course, the other problem is when you're septic, your gut's not working well and it's difficult to feed anyway. So if you're even able to get some um, parental nutrition into this patient as you're trying to clear them from the sepsis would be very important. But I, I think, you know, a lot of us forget and about the, the, the donor site morbidities uh, that, that, that go along with these patients. There's, there's no doubt, uh, and I think that it is shining, basically, is through the um, debate that the management of hypermetabolism is definitely multidisciplinary. Uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to bring uh, two members of the panel. Um, First, uh, I'd like to bring Joe Hussey uh, and ask him, Joe, we have actually uh, uh, seen a number of interventions that in the acute periods uh, may have an impact on the control of hypermetabolism. As uh, uh, a critical care physician, uh, what do you think uh, is the role of critical care and anesthesia and what interventions you feel that can make a difference from your specialism in order to control unfavorable outcome in this uh, complex pediatric patient? Uh, thanks, Jorge. Um, well, I, I, I think anesthesia and critical care can actually uh, uh, be used uh, in, in a number of areas. I mean, I think the things I, that I want to mention uh, that haven't been mentioned so far is actual um, dealing with the analgesia requirements of the uh, patients, which are, are, are 
quite massive actually and as Sarah's uh, mentioned before it really is uh, the bedrock of getting decent um, uh, rehabilitation going. Um, we tend to uh, use o opioids as the sort of bedrock of, um, of analgesia but I think it's important to have a uh, a, a sort of stepwise uh, manner of dealing with this uh, with um, frequent uh, uh, so, sort of um, assessment of pain and conceptually we, um, we look at pain in terms of sort of background pain and um, uh, incident pain so whether that be for um, dressing changes uh, for um, uh, physiotherapy and that sort of thing. And it's important to get those things right. Um, we often use other um, sort of co-analgesics such as um, ketamine, which is uh, widely used in, in low, low doses, and clonidine as well, which, uh, which can be very, very helpful. Um, in the... Um, in the adult population, we often also um, uh, try to get adults and, and children. It's quite important to get them off the ventilator as early as possible. In the adult population, we often uh, elect to do um, an early tracheostomy, actually, which will allow a lot of uh, 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 ongoing care. Children, obviously, there's an awful lot more uh, morbidity with, with um, tracheostomy, um, so we're less likely to do that. But actually getting them off the ventilator early is, is, is quite important. And then the other thing is infection. Um, proper antibiotic stewardship. Obviously, this child here um, is septic, needs, needs antibiotics as well as uh, surgical intervention. But actually going forward, proper anti antibiotic stewardship um, to make sure that we're not um, sort of breeding out these multi-resistant bugs are important. Uh, that is a fantastic question. And that brings me, uh, you have named it um, about, you know, the importance of actually intervention by multiple areas. Uh, and, and specifically in this complex uh, uh, patients that arise delayed, potentially having his uh, wounds contaminated because of a uh, um, uh, slightly unusual way to dress the wounds. I'd like to bring uh, my colleague, Nicole Lee, to give us an idea about if this patient comes uh, into uh, a, uh, a better resource country and like in, uh, like, uh, um, in your unit, uh, Nicole, what type of advice would you give regarding uh, general nursing care and the best uh, dressing care that you could actually just provide in this case? Um, so obviously um, having been put out in a pond of stagnant water um, obviously is going to throw up whatever is within that water system so getting the wound area clean to start with is really important I suppose it does depend on how quickly they go to theatre um, and get debrided um, but we need to start some antimicrobial and topical support on that um, on the infection fight uh, right at the wound bed so arguably we'd start with something it, it may be this patient needs a shower um, to start with to get uh, with an antimicrobial just to reduce that bacterial load in the wound bed um, but then following on with um, some higher end antimicrobials some betadines vinegars hypochlorites things like that that might actually help treat the infection at the wound bed um, just as a starting point maybe following on later on if the infected wounds um, continue uh, we need to look at a two-week basis trying to keep our um, antimicrobials working so um, every two weeks looking at changing them maybe um, I would fully support all of the discussions around the pain relief as well um, I think from a nursing point of view it's really important to remember you give your um, pain relief but you need to give it time to work so knowing how long it takes for that to work is really important. Um, so um, by giving the pain relief maybe a 20 minute window with your opioids, you'll get your best peak of um, pain relief. Um, so timing that along with your colleagues so that things like physiotherapy, 
can be done um, in a in the best way possible, especially with a child, um, and um, working with parents as well to make sure that they understand that yes, there will be some discomfort, um, but we're going to keep that to a minimum. Uh, it will mean that you'll get the better outcomes with that physiotherapy and support as well. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, I'm going to ask uh, one more question to uh, Professor Marjeski before I hand over. Uh, to my colleague Oran Shelley with the polling questions and the second case. Uh, Mark, um, I'd like first of all to wholeheartedly thank you for your participation and for your enlightening us uh, with your knowledge. Uh, and there's one question uh, from one of our colleagues that says, uh, what are the clinical endpoints when we are giving propanolol and oxandrolone? Uh, and because we know that hypermetabolism continues after the wounds have healed. When do we stop? And, what, and how do we give them simultaneously? Thanks, Mark. Um, no, well, thank you for actually first of having me. It's, uh, it has been a great honor uh, and, and fantastic uh, to be part of this group. Uh, so when to stop anabolic agents? Well, there are studies that uh, give it for five years and see benefits, particularly in children for growth uh, development. Um, but I am not sure about the resource nor the, the aspect of monitoring. It's gonna be difficult. You have to monitor your heart rate daily, your blood pressure. You have to see if the child developing. So I do find this complex, but there is a benefit of giving it longer. Um, you can combine agents. Uh, Propanol is mainly anti-catabolic. You can combine it with an anabolic agent, such as Zendrolone. You can even give metformin because they have all different mechanisms of interactions. But I, I personally believe to keep it clean, some sort of, and maybe combine it one or two only. And you, I, I would say, give it to the comfort that you feel safely giving it, right? And monitor what you expect. So I personally uh, give Propanol here because we lose our patients to our outside, uh, rehab hospital. I don't see them. So I feel uncomfortable in saying, oh, just continue Propanol because I do not know what, what's there. On the other hand, Oxandrolone, you can really check every two to three months and saying, yep, is there side effects, how the LFTs, uh, that's safety to be continued. Uh, metformin is relatively easy as well, but you have to have a glucose check. So insulin obviously is not in the question. Um, and so I'm saying that whatever is feasible, wherever you practice and it's safe, continue. Obviously, if you have a big burn, the longer you do give uh, the medication, the better it is. And you need to make sure at the same time, I think just as the last second, there are monitoring the diet of kids. For example, don't let them eat McDonald's. I'm sorry to say McDonald's, I, I apologize, but don't let them add trashy food because that is not what you want. You need to make sure you monitor what they eat. They need to eat more adequate. They need to make sure the kids go play and exercise. It's very important. Again, those two factors alone are more anabolic than anything else. And then in terms of adults, you do very similar aspects, but I would not put a stop in. I, I would put your stop individually in saying you need to stop at discharge from acute hospitalization. Well, so it is. Longer, if you have the monitoring system, great. Combination, yes, you can combine. Thank you very much, Mark. At the very end of the day, I feel that some of the interventions to see the success of propanol, I would say that they're in front of us. You know, the gain in body weight, which, which means basically increasing in, in lean body mass, in success of nutrition, the mobilization of the patient, which means that yeah. exercise and physiotherapy are working, the healing of the wounds, which means that nursing basically has been successful, the patient basically going back to society, which means that the graft has uh, has taken. Um, I'd like to uh, before proceed to the polling questions to ask uh, the, a final question uh, to uh, my colleagues, Tambir Ahmed and, and Raja Sabapathy. Uh, Tambir, first of all, um, based on what you uh, have heard and based on the complex case that we have shown, um, are there any strategies basically that you would be able to uh, warrant success in the outcome of this patient? Uh, and uh, the same uh, once Tanvir responds to you, Raja. Thanks, Tanvir. Yeah. Actually, in our uh, setting, uh, uh, you know, what I stated before, uh, we actually uh, concerned on the recession because most of the cases are the same. They used to reach to the hospital uh, very late and there is no resuscitation. And at this moment, uh, we are focusing on uh, uh, the early mobilization and also the NG feeding. And, and very recent, we have taken the initiative to work with our NSS because our uh, ICU is maintained by the NSS. So uh, they are very... Uh, keen to start uh, the 
uh, pharmaceutical means that is the propanol that is the available one so we are planning to uh, on thursday just we, we decided to go for uh, a change and we should start the things and uh, for our infection control as we don't have any infection control team uh, we usually based on the empirical start of the antibiotics later on we send the uh, the wound swab and accordingly we try to start the uh, appropriate antibiotic and actually we don't have the resources for the allograft but we have just <coughs> procured a skin bank uh, uh, machineries and we have we are planning to train and but uh, the problem with the law and a lot many things so at this moment we can go for any uh, sort of uh, allografts rather we are changing the dressings and when the patient is settled then we used to focus for the uh, early yeah the, then excision and grafting so in this way we are trying to manage the things thank you raja your, your views please so i think for this the delayed presentations are quite challenging so what we do is that first we like to resuscitate the patient and then on the day number one, it soon comes, comes to us, we just give a good wash and probably one or two days later, we try to take the patient to the OR and then we, we try to excise the whole of the burn and then try to put an allograft in, we start early nutrition and um, uh, propanolol, we try to do it once they have uh, the good cardiovascular stability and the, we do start on propanolol. And in our country, we don't get oxandrolone because it's a drug of abuse. So what we have done is that instead of oxandrolone, we do we give nandrolone, which is a 50 milligram intramuscular injection, which lasts for two to three weeks. So once every two to three weeks, we give nandrolone. The difference between nandrolone and oxandrolone is that there are more hirsutism properties in the nandrolone. And that's the only thing about uh, nandrolone, but we try to give that. And I think the most important thing is early excision. Once we remove the bad stuff out, it gets better. Thank you very much, uh, um, Raja. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists. And before we proceed uh, to um, the polling questions, at this stage, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much, Professor Jeshki, for our contribution. Um, the questions that you have got uh, in front of you, I have got a very binary answer. I'm going to ask my colleague and co-chair, Oren Shelley, uh, to run this for you. Oren. Yeah, thanks, Jorge. Um, so we've got a number of questions here that reflect on uh, certain aspects of discussion that have been brought out so eloquently, both in the talk and uh, the subsequent discussion. Uh, so we'd be grateful if you could uh, uh, answer these questions uh, for us and uh, it may be that they've all come up together. I'm not quite sure of this. But um, the first question is, do you have a protocol or ladder in your unit for burn analgesia? Um, uh, if you could answer this, yes or no. Um, the second question is, do you have a protocol or guideline for nutrition? Um, and again, that is going to be a yes or no. So are there specific protocols that you follow for patients when they come in? Uh, the third question is, do you have a protocol or guideline for antibiotic stewardship and infection control? Again, if you have, please yes and, and no. Um, and then the last question that we have is do you have a protocol or guideline for wound management, dressings and closure? So all of these are quite uh, important questions. Uh, so again, reflecting on protocols for analgesia, protocols for nutrition, pro protocols for antibiotic stewardship and for wound management. So I think all of these may come together. We seem to be fairly static in the number. Well, we have a few people continuing to respond. So if we could uh, get a few more people, that would be fantastic. Um, so thanks, Jorge, for everything so far. Thanks to all the panelists so far um, and to all the team. I think uh, some great uh, 
discussion there around uh, the management of uh, uh, challenging case of uh, delay in presentation and how we're going to address the and influence the metabolic aspects of uh, burn injury. Now, almost at half of the participants having uh, participated, and I'm just going to end the polling there. So um, I'm going to share the results. Okay, Jorge. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, this is interesting. Um, I think I'd like, Mr. Santelis, before we proceed to the um, second case, which would be that of an adult with a challenging burn, to talk uh, about these aspects because I think that they impact quite tremendously on the outcome of the patient. Uh, it appears that uh, half of the patient, half of the uh, um, of our attendants, have got a protocol guideline uh, for for nutrition. Um, Natasha, at this stage. Can you give us some bullet points regarding what would be the main stem of nutrition not to forget in either adults or children that could be replicated for our colleague in LMI seats? Yeah, so I think the um, nutritional uh, take home message probably would be that your nutritional guideline needs to include um, sort of identifying barriers to getting adequate nutrition and possible solutions. So particularly, for example, management of feed intolerance. So if you've got uh, problems with delayed gastric emptying, constipation, uh, gut dysmotility, um, you could have the best feed targets in the world, but actually if they're not able to utilize, absorb and retain um, and have adequate access, then actually nutrition is not gonna be successful. So um, sort of bedside advice for, for nurses to be able to action on the spot, really, um, sort of monitoring gastric residual volumes and making uh, first lines sort of interventions with regards to starting prokinetics or advancing into post caloric feeding positions so that you can maximize feed retention and identify problems early. I think is probably key to any nutritional guideline, um, other than just the basics of working out a patient specific nutritional target um, for each individual that comes through that's sort of to do with either the sort of age, gender, burn surface area, all the sorts of basics such as that um, would probably be my key advice. And certainly our nutritional guidelines do include the use of propanolol and oxandrolone for all burns over 40%. And obviously if resources allow, it's something I would advocate in all practices that can, can do that as well. Thank you very much, Natasha. I'd like to bring into the discussion both Bill and Joe Hussey. Um, Bill, uh, can you give us, uh, again, some points that can be replicated across the board of geography anywhere in the world regarding best practice about wound closure that can have a direct impact on, the, uh, on developing catabolism? Thank you, Bill. Sure. I, one thing I always like to say, too, to my residents is kind of the, the burn is the source of all evil, and excising it and getting it covered is very important. And it doesn't always have to be with their own skin right away. So I think early excision, I usually would like to do about 20, 25% at a time over a couple of days. And if they don't have enough of their own skin to cover, I will usually do um, alloderm or uh, some kind of uh, xenoderm or even a dermal replacement, which I, which I think is very important uh, to at least get it closed. Uh, I think, you know, when we talk about nutrition, starting feeds as early as possible. And we start them during resuscitation with an NG tube. But I think it's more important too, to make sure that the, uh, you have something that the patient likes to eat. People can be finicky in what, in, in, in what they like. And especially when we give high protein snacks or supplements that, you know, you, you can put these on, give them to the patient, but if they don't like them or take them, they're not going to do anything. So I think we, we actually have choices for protein bars or drinks or even milkshakes, something else that's a high protein supplement for people taking their own nutrition, which I believe is very important also. Thank you, Bill. Um, just on, the, on that note, uh, uh, Joe, uh, suddenly surgery is very painful. And I feel basically is that before we proceed to the second patient, it is actually as worth to say, everyone has highlighted that there is no uh, gain without pain. 
but pain is very difficult and actually just increases hypermetabolism. Can you give us basically some guidance that again can be replicated across the board regarding analgesia? And on that point, what are your views about escalation? What are the use on non-steroidals, paracetamol, and when do you introduce opioids? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jorge. Um, well, generally speaking, we, we uh, follow probably like m many other uh, medics across the world, the sort of WHO ladder um, for, for analgesia, um, starting with simple analgesia and um, going up to more, more complex stuff. Um, generally speaking, we use um, uh, paracetamol, acetaminophen, wherever you are in the, in the world, in, in, in most of our patients actually is a co-analgesic. Co From the point of view of non-steroidals, um, we, we tend to um, be shy of them if, if we've got a, any, any degree of resuscitation, so a resuscitation level um, burn, um, certainly at the start of, uh, of, their, of their journey, mainly because of the um, sort of high, high rates of uh, stress ulceration and uh, issues around um, renal function as well. Um, so we tend not, not to use that. Um, almost invariably, um, patients with significant burns will, will need some form of opioid. Um, we tend to uh, use uh, longer acting opioids for um, background pain and it's important when you're assessing pain to actually uh, find out when the pain is occurring is it there all the time um, is it there only when um, you're doing things like uh, physiotherapy that sort of thing and you need to sort of titrate these things up and down accordingly and really you should be um, re-evaluating this every, you know every day at least um, and you know, we do it um, twice a day on our on our, on our ward rounds. Um, it would be worth noting that most um, uh, burn patients who are with us for a long time do obviously have uh, changes in their pharmacokinetic um, profiles and also the way they react to the drugs, pharmacodynamics. Um, and this is particularly um, important with opioids because pe um, people do tend to uh, get uh, resistant to, to, to opioids. So we do have to look at alternatives in conjunction. Um, and we, we uh, things that are available in many parts of the world, we use ketamine um, a lot, not just for uh, anesthesia, but in sub-anesthetic doses to um, reduce the uh, uh, requirements, opiate requirements, and um, alpha 2 agonists such as clonidine, which are relatively cheap, um, can be given entrally as well. Um, and finally, it's important to de-escalate these drugs um, as time uh, as time goes on as well, because you don't want somebody on opioids for for years and years. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. We're going to um, now introduce another challenging case uh, of, uh, um, in this case, basically, it's going to be an adult. Um, so this is a male with a large burn, nearly 40%, of which a large percentage is full thickness due to a petrol explosion. And they, these injuries are associated with an inhalational injury and delayed resuscitation. We have got some problems here, um, a low BMI, and potentially a bad and compromised physiology because of heavier smoking and a drinking habit. Um, there are a number of uh, further obstacles that you can see here with large aspirates suggesting sepsis and a challenging uh, problems with soft tissue cover and potential ongoing sepsis. Um, I'd like to open the discussion and I'll, I'll hand over uh, to start the discussion to my colleague and co-chair Oren Shen. Oren. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jorge. Now, unfortunately, I, I can't see everybody uh, to know who's there, but I, I, um, 
read through the case and we'll get everybody to give some thoughts. So um, this is hopefully a fairly typical presentation that many of us will see. Um, uh, you know, a young man with a hopefully survivable injury, 25% burns, um, petrol explosion, an inhalation injury. Again, the first attenders or on the scene, no first aid. However, um, is getting seen some three hours following uh, the surgery uh, or following the injury. Um, quite typical in many places, he's uh, somebody with a low body mass index. It's very difficult to, to um, uh, determine uh, whether there's issues with malnutrition and so forth at this point. Um, smoker, drinks. And so he's been uh, brought to us. Um, and he's got, and I suppose I'd like to ask uh, perhaps uh, Tanvir from a, a surgical point of view. Um, can you tell me um, what are your priorities uh, for this gentleman and uh, how would you manage him? And uh, bearing in mind, we've just heard about how we're going to try and modulate metabolism. Um, how do you manage this patient in terms of uh, uh, timing of surgery, uh, analgesia, and nutrition, and so forth? Thank you. Actually, uh, this sort of cases, uh, actually, we encountered uh, three to four years back. There is sudden uh, unrest in our country, which actually evoked a lot of petrol bomb-like attacks into the uh, vehicles, and we received a lot of patients like this. So uh, what uh, we did, the scenarios like that. So so resuscitation, uh, initially we actually focused on the resuscitation and the problem with most of the cases, there is uh, uh, upper respiratory tract uh, inhalation injuries are common. So, uh, so the safeguard of the, <coughs> uh, the airway was our uh, prime uh, concern. And we used to focus on the development of the edema and to reduce the, to focus on the, how to reduce the edema into the uh, airway. So most of the cases we actually require to uh, go for the diversion of the airway. Uh, airway. So, and as we, has, uh, we have the uh, facilities for the hyperbaric oxygen, uh, chambers and in the in as uh, in the cases where there is uh, the scope we actually uh, transfer the patient over there but before that we actually manage the wound as per our protocol we used to change the dressings very uh, rapidly and for the uh, safety we used to go for the uh, cb uh, central venous access and for the nutrition, as we don't have any nutritionist, a nutritionist in our uh, hospital, uh, but we used to maintain the nutrition through the NG tubes as usual. And uh, in, as our diet is mostly based on the carbohydrate prawns, but we used to add the proteins like the egg and the yogurts and the powdered uh, uh, milk and the pulses and the meats. We used to encourage those things through the NG tubes. And actually um, for the surgery, uh, in, uh, uh, in many of the cases, we actually focus on the stability of the patient first. And then uh, if it is uh, safe, then we used to send the patient for the excision. And in the first setting, we never covered it with the grafts. Actually we excised it and uh, actually cover the wound with the dressings and we used to change the dressings for one or two settings and when and uh, it is it looks good then we used to go for the grafts so in this way actually we actually manage these cases in our setting thank you very much uh, Tanvir um, I'd like to bring Sarah smiles in this case Sarah, this is obviously a challenging case from the respiratory point of view. Uh, would you enlighten us about the strategies that you would envisage would actually lead to a successful outcome and potentially um, also share with the audience your views about early tracheostomy versus no tracheostomy at all, specifically in a LMIC environment? Sarah.
I'm not sure if Sarah has got some problems there. Uh, can I bring Can I bring Joe Hussey to give his views about uh, how to best manage from the point of view the um, respiratory function of this patient? And Joe, is specifically about tracheostomies, yes or no, and when? Yeah, I mean, I suppose first of all, you've got to um, acknowledge that this this uh, inhalational injury will um, will dramatically increase the systemic inflammatory response and actually if you uh, don't deal with the um, fluid management well during this time it, this may be the factor that actually prevents you getting to the operating theatre um, so you have to be very really really careful around fluid management at this time um, uh, from the point of view of tracheostomies um, we we tr um, we're actually uh, converts now, I think, certainly in the adult population to, to early tracheostomies. Um, the reason being, um, well, many fold really. Um, we can uh, avoid the iatrogenic damage of uh, over sedation in patients from the intensive care unit. Um, we, can, um, we can get the patients to get involved with their therapy, active therapy, relatively early as well. Um, and it allows us to um, provide decent um, levels of um, sedation for um, procedures as well without, without having to worry about um, uh, sort of airway uh, management so, uh, so much going forward. Um, when we do it, um, we try and do it pretty early if we can it, it's likely that the first excision is probably too early to be doing it but certainly um, um, you know within sort of 96 hours or so we would we would try to be looking at the um, uh, early tracheostomy um, and it, uh, it, it we found it works well Sarah's actually doing some work uh, um, research on this at the moment Is uh, Sarah back with us, uh, I wonder? Um, maybe not. Nicole is uh, with us still, I hope. Um, a lot of these patients, I know, Nicole, you, uh, uh, Raja and uh, Tanvir will see um, uh, come in and, and they have some uh, delay before they have the surgery. Uh, do you think that the best thing is just to, to keep them in the bed, uh, Nicole, or do you think that there's an uh, important... Uh, aspects with mobilizing this patient even before they have their operation if it's delayed? Um, so I suppose it depends on how much support they're on. Um, if we can wake them up and get them mobilizing, then yes, we'll always try that. Um, I think um, it's difficult one. I think um, establishing the feed um, needs to be one of the nursing um, things that we get started straight away. Um, I think um, it, that can be difficult as well um, because uh, we need to be thinking about um, whether or not that gut is a bit edematous and whether or not it can cope with the feed. So we set, tend to start our feeds a bit slower um, and then we'll um, react accordingly. We'll take regular aspirates, uh, work out whether or not there's a massive gastric content. Um, if there is, we'll only return about 100 mils normally um, and then we'll do that regularly. Um, but obviously, um, if we're getting them up and mobilising and awake, then potentially that will um, it can tend to establish it a bit quicker because um, the gut tends to get going as well. Um, but um, we, we might add in things like metacoprides. Um, we'll start with um, regular laxatives right from the day they are admitted. Uh, so we're on top of that right away. Um, and in, just in case there's any um, impact, um, disimpaction needed later, uh, we've got a protocol for that too. Um, I think the only other thing we haven't really mentioned massively is around temperature control. Um, and I think that's obviously something that was mentioned a lot earlier. Um, and we're always trying to keep our patients nice and warm. Um, and if you don't have the ability to have them temperature controlled areas to do that, that can be quite difficult. So actually managing your patient's temperature can be the only way to get around that. Um, so by having um, warming blankets um, and things, um, we kind of tend to aim for our patients around 38, 38, 5. 
um, because we know they're always going to be that bit hotter. And if they're not at that temperature, then they tend to be driving themselves to get back to it. Um, so um, from a nursing care point of view, we're constantly giving them uh, or having the warming blankets on. Um, I, I've said it a few times, we're either warming them up or cooling them down according to what part of the day we're at. Um, but yeah, I think um, getting them up and moving is really key to getting things going and getting guts going and stuff like that. Um, so um, I would always um, suggest that's the best way, get them awake and going, if possible. Okay. Um, can I, uh, uh, can I uh, bring at this uh, uh, stage the points of view of uh, uh, Raja regarding tracheostomy? Raja, what are your, uh, what are, what are your timetable um, to uh, start a, uh, a change in the airway management uh, in this patient? that potentially is likely to require long-term ventilation? Uh, we, uh, we think of, uh, if especially if they're going to have inhalation burns, we realize that they may need to be having some form of support, respiratory support. And hence we try and tend to do the uh, tracheostomy quite early. So somewhere around a week to 10 days or something like that, and we, uh, we, uh, we do it at that point of time. And uh, suppose if there are deep burns over the neck, we excise it and autograft it and uh, so that we get uh, ready to go for tr tracheostomy. We definitely do find that if you're going to do tracheostomy early, it reduces the amount of sedations that we give and then we can try to get them uh, out of the uh, tube early because the more, the more the time of tubing, the more complications that can happen. Thank you very much. Um, I think that uh, we should introduce now an element of confusion into the management of this patient, which is we have got somebody with a very low BMI with potential um, malnutrition, and that potentially is also may or may not have a degree of liver derangement and uh, uh, respiratory impairment because of his uh, heavy uh, smoking and, and drinking habits. Uh, Natasha, can I have your points of view uh, regarding the management of this potentially malnourished patient with a BMI of 19, in which we need to uh, basically increase lean body mass? Yeah, I mean, my first feeling is really that actually you, you won't achieve any increase in lean body mass during this acute phase of burn recovery, this, this um, or burn reconstruction. It's something for probably much later down the line. Um, the priorities early on would be obviously once you've got them medically stabilized, you've got them up to sort of a, a, a decent feed to provide their macronutrients, is actually we, we need to make sure we don't forget the, the patient's micronutrient needs in this scenario. So if we've got a slim gentleman with a complex social history, perhaps alcohol misuse, actually you're probably going to find that he's uh, malnourished from a micronutrient perspective. Um, and the unhealed donor sites at day 20 is, is, is a sign of that potentially. Um, so what I would say is that normally with this patient group, high alcohol intake, you'd be prioritizing replacing his B vitamins, but actually you could probably assume that certain his trace elements, his vitamin D would like to be there as well. Um, and he would probably need just a, a general multivitamin on top of his enteral feed to make sure you're maximizing the micronutrient delivery because this chap's injury isn't actually that big. It's 25%. When it's a very big burn, when you're sort of feeding patients with, you know, 60, 70% burn surface areas, their calorie needs are so high, it means they get such a large volume of feed, they get a large volume of micronutrients. But with only 25% burn surface area, his calorie needs aren't going to be so high that you're going to be giving a huge volume of feed and therefore a huge amount of micronutrients. So you're probably going to need a multivitamin on top, um, which is, you know, a, a quite a cheap and easy um, treatment to do, you know, even an over-the-counter product that can be, um, you know, crushed and put down would be absolutely fine in this sort of scenario. Uh, Bill, um, I'd like to bring you here because we have got, obviously, yes, an issue in a, a patient basis with very deranged physiology. And I will bring uh, Sarah Smiles uh, after that. Uh, obviously, because of uh, uh, his poor nitrogen balance, the potential, you know, deranged physiology because of his uh, um, habits and uh, low BMI, the potential of sepsis, um, we're having problems with wound healing. What strategies can you suggest in a patient that is on the brink of respiratory failure and uh, sepsis to make sure that we have got 
a better outcome from his unhealed donor sites after three weeks following injury? I, I think there's a, a couple of things to, to keep in mind. Um, just with the patient himself, this is someone I probably would start on um, oxandrolone. I've, I've used quite a bit of it and, and I'm happy with it, uh, making sure, of course, that there, there's no prostate cancer. But another important thing, even before you get there, is with the history of drinking, making sure that he doesn't go into um, DTs. Uh, so, you know, recognizing that even if they're, they're, they're intubated could be a problem and lead to more metabolism. Um, I think proper wound, wound care, you know, is, is the basis of what we do, even after excision. And if we're having trouble with the wounds, making sure, number one, that there is no um, overgrowth of bacteria superficially. Uh, so if we need to change our antibiotic regimen around, um, usually around this point, if we're talking two weeks after, you know, we're after grafting, we're having problems, I may either do a sulfamylon solution or a silver nitrate solution, which I like quite a bit, keeping in mind uh, the different um, uh, derangements that could cause with sodium or with increased acidosis with the uh, sulfamylon. Um, frequent dressing changes, washing the patient, I think is very important. And I don't think there's much better than, than actually getting the patient back to the tub room, getting them washed and doing the uh, dressing changes to decrease the superficial bacterial load. And of course, if there's any eschar I didn't remove, I would probably cover that with the sulfamylon cream. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, Sarah, um, we were discussing basically is the potential for this patient to require a tracheostomy. Obviously, that has got a number of advantages in terms of reducing the dead space, facilitating a toilet of the airway, and, and obviously reducing the potential of sedation. But would you be able to suggest some strategies that facilitate um, uh, respiratory improvement in this patient whilst at the same time improving his uh, uh, function in terms of mobilization? This is obviously especially uh, uh, important in somebody uh, with a low BMI and, and potentially is low muscle power. What are your thoughts? Apologies for my um, blackout there. That's the joys of Zoom for you. Um, yeah, so this, this patient does present a number of challenges once again. Um, I note he's got a smoke inhalation injury. So um, immediate treatment there would involve probably intubating this patient to secure the airway um, and um, then uh, clearing the carbonaceous stuff from the airways as soon as possible. This is so important um, and is a, it has a major role for, for respiratory physio um, to do this because this stuff, this black stuff that covers the airways is usually either acidic or alkaline. It's, it contains many toxins. So the quicker we clear that stuff out, the better the lung function um, and better the outcome for the patient. Um, we give a triple re regime of nebulizers here in our unit, um, which consists of uh, salbutamol, um, uh, and acetylcysteine and also heparin nebulizers. Um, and this is to try and clear all the airways as quickly as possible, but that can only be achieved with good tracheal toileting, positioning the patient from side to side, use of manual techniques uh, to try and um, assist with that too. Now, in terms of ventilation, um, I don't know in my absence if we discussed use of um, protective ventilatory strategies or open lung strategies, um, to try and um, protect the lungs from permanent damage from volutrauma, barotrauma, um, and damage, you know, permanent damage from the ventilator. So, um, so use of, you know, PEEP and um, keeping pressures under control so that we are achieving six, six mils per kilo uh, body weight is, is really a sensible strategy for these patients. I note that he's got a progressive smoke inhalation injury, which I'm assuming is now ARDS or acute lung injury, something like that, in which case that, that approach becomes very, very important. Um, did we discuss early tracheostomy for patients who are going to be ventilated um, at all? Yes, we, so we, we brought basically the discussion, to Sarah, about, and I was asking Joseph, but I would like to hear your points of view. Yeah. Uh, Bill basically bring also a number of thoughts regarding basically as early versus late tracheostomy timing advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, so it, for this sort of patient in our unit, 
Um, if it's obvious you're not going to be able to extubate the patient within the first couple of days, then we would track them really early. You, this, this patient's pathway will um, involve a number of uh, uh, anaesthetic trips to the operation th uh, to the operating room, numerous dressing changes under heavy sedation or anaesthetic, uh, and this having a tracheostomy doesn't it's, it doesn't just allow you to toilet the patient more easily and less dead space, so that will give you better respiratory function, but it also enables a quick wake up. You can use different drugs. You can give the patient a general anaesthetic and keep feeding the patient throughout. So you don't need to nil by mouth them, um, which is really important with this underweight patient with poor healing. Um, but from my perspective, um, I like tracheostomy because we can get these patients awake. As soon as they're awake, they're actively exercising. And this guy is quite wasted already. He's cachectic, BMI of 19. If we keep him lying in the bed, he's going to waste away any muscles he's got because he's going to be catabolic. He's just going to turn into a jellyfish. So we kind of need to get this guy moving. So early active exercise in the bed, use of, use of analgesia here. If he's um, sedated then obviously your, your capacity for active exercise is limited, um, but then you should passively exercise. So we would still get patients up, um, even if they're kind of semi-awake, semi we'd still get patients moving. And that's really, really important. The last thing I wanna just mention is contractures. This guy's got right upper limb burn. I don't know where it is on the right upper limb, but early positioning and splinting to try and avoid contractures is, is key here. Because the earlier you start that stuff, the, the better the outcome for the patient. Uh, thanks very much for that, Sarah. That's really great. I think, um, you know, you've emphasized there the role of uh, exercise in protecting the muscle mass, which is a, a key part of what we're talking about. I think one other aspect we're talking about is this patient is now also not absorbing the feed. I think uh, Natasha, I, I'd like to bring Natasha Raja Tanvir in on this. Uh, Natasha first. Um, this patient has um, got high NG aspirates. He's already underweight. Um, what should we do next? Um, uh, what you, we've talked about nutrients and micronutrients. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on, on this when the patient's non-absorbing? Um, so look, I think you need to kind of try, give some thought as to why he's not absorbing. Is it just a simple delayed gastric emptying? In which case that's usually quite easily rectified by um, advancing the feeding tube to a post caloric position or assisting gastric um, or just um, bowel motility and gastric emptying through the use of prokinetic. Um, and our first line here is metoclopamide. Um, or is there more of a, a, a sort of pathological problem within somewhere within the GI tract? So if it's sort of an abdo pressure forcing feed up back into the stomach. Um, then actually you need to be addressing why is there um, an increased pressure within the abdomen and what protective measures do you need to take to make sure that doesn't become um, sort of ischemic damage within, it, within a small bowel. So in that scenario, you would um, potentially stop the feed. Um, you might need to do some imaging, make sure that you haven't already got some ischemic changes, look at decompressing um, the bowel and the, and the stomach as, as well as a priority. Um, because actually stepping back on feeding for a day or two while you're getting that gut back to a healthy functioning position again will have a much better outcome long term in nutritional management. Um, if it is just sort of a feed intolerance side of things, perhaps um, with a long term sort of alcohol misuse, a little bit of uh, sort of pancreatic insufficiency or, or whatnot, then it can be worthwhile swapping from a polymeric feed to a peptide or a semi-elemental feed and see if you can get a little bit of an improved tolerance from that perspective, um, sort of aiming for uh, perhaps not so much of a concentrated feed, so you're not getting, uh, pulling in sort of a um, fluid and creating perhaps osmotic diarrhea, which we can often see as well. Um, so, you know, there's scope to sort of have a bit of a play around um, to find what feed is better tolerated, what sorts of rates are better tolerated, um, looking for the sort of better position of feed uh, delivery and, and prokinetic use, as long as there's not pathology. I think if pathology is there, then step back. Uh, can I just ask you, just to further on, what kind of foods would you recommend? A lot of places may not have direct access to enteral feeding and so forth, but you're very familiar with different uh, 
Uh, what would you recommend uh, in lower middle income settings as, as good sources of protein? Yeah, I think um, I think it was uh, Dr. Tanvir gave some really good examples actually of some of the sort of food items that can either be taken orally or prepared to go down in sort of sterile techniques, go down in through an NG tube, and they would predominantly be dairy-based products, so the milk powders, um, sort of uh, yogurts and, and egg-based uh, proteins. Um, orally can be really helpful to be use making use of legume based um, proteins so sort of high energy high protein uh, solutions sort of based from sort of uh, peanut uh, peanut pastes or peanut or um, powders um, all those sorts of things are, are really great sources of of nutrition in a in a um, in a lower income setting uh, thanks Tash that's really good and uh, maybe I could ask uh, Raja first and, and then Tanvir afterwards. Um, in this setting, you know, do you use some of these uh, nutritional supports? Do you use prokinetics uh, as the first uh, question, uh, Raja? And then the second question that I'd like to talk, ask you to answer is, do, do you use propranolol and do you use um, anabolic steroids? And is that available and is that costly? Thanks, Raja. So uh, uh, for uh, regarding uh, uh, prokinetics, we, we uh, sometimes do, do use the prokinetics when we feel that they're not absorbing. But anytime they're not absorbing, I think the first thing that we start thinking is, is the patient on sepsis? I think because when the patient is on sepsis, the patients don't absorb. And then we also do a procalcitonin, which, which comes at least easier to us. And we find the procalcitonin is a level so high, then first we start thinking for the where all the sepsis could be. Is it the burn wound? Is it the urinary tract? Is it the respiratory tract? And so on. And that, that's how we first uh, start uh, thinking about it. And of course, uh, if we don't find anything over there, then we start using uh, prokinetics. And of course, we start to feeding it from feeding the patient quite uh, early. Initially, we may feed it a little lesser, but we start to uh, do feeding. And especially in a lot of our uh, uh, people, they are, as, as Natasha told, that they are less on micronutrients. And so we always give them micronutrients. And the other thing is the time in. A lot of these, especially on this uh, alcoholics and people just refeeding, we give a time in and we also look out for the potassium and magnesium. So these are the sort of things that we do for the uh, regarding a prokinetics and they're not absorbing. So that's the world. And regarding uh, propanolol, we do use uh, propanolol, but then we use propanol only after they are out of the ventilator. Uh, they are not on any uh, NORAD or any other inotropic support. And only then we start using a propanolol. We aim to achieve uh, around a 15 to 20 percentage reduction of the heart rate. We titrate a dose accordingly, and then we do give it. And as I told earlier, we, we do not get uh, oxandrolone because it's not there in our in our uh, place in India. Drug of abuse. So we do uh, injection nandrolone, 50 milligram intramuscular injection once every two to three weeks. Super. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, um, and uh, I, I know we've had a little discussion about this and uh, the fact that the, the, the Sandal has, has more of a virilizing effect than the oxandrolone, isn't that right? Um, can I ask, do you also uh, manage sugar control with uh, insulin? Do you use uh, metformin? Um, we do look at our uh, sugar levels and uh, especially in the, in the ITU, we use uh, insulin. But then we don't aim to uh, get a, a very a low reduction, a low reduction of your blood sugar. We somewhere reach somewhere aim at around 140 to 180 uh, milligrams because we don't want a patient to go for hypoglycemia. We have not used metformin as such. We have not used metformin. Okay, thanks, Raja. And can I ask uh, Tanvir the, the same question, just now focusing more on the nutritional aspect? Um, do you have a protocol? Do you use um, uh, NG feeding, uh, use prokinetics, um, and then also could you reflect on the use of propranolol and uh, other anabolic steroids to modulate the metabolic response? Tanvir? Actually, uh, <laughs> the real scenario in the uh, many of the countries like Bangladesh is that in the hospitals, actually they are uh, fully supported by the government. 
and the supplies are from the government. So our everything is dependent on the government supply. So those are more general. So what happens in our uh, hospitals? We we actually supply a general diet for all the patients. So we don't have any uh, special diet system in the hospital, which are available in all of the hospital across the world in the developing worlds. So very uh, in our hospital, uh, we have uh, actually we are able to uh, motivate our policymakers and the government to uh, actually uh, establish a modern kitchen. Without kitchen and a good system, we can supply the required uh, food to the patient, especially for the patients admitted to the uh, ICU or ASU, because they will require the special uh, foods and special preparation and a nutritionist or a dietitian. So we are arranging. But what we are doing at this moment, actually, we most of the times we used to give the list to the patients and the caregivers. And actually, this responsibility is solely taken by our nurses. Actually, uh, we have a chart. We used to prepare a chart for the uh, special diets. But I mentioned before, we actually, uh, our diet is um, uh, actually uh, based on the carbohydrate rich. So we are focusing on the more protein, like the egg, powdered meal, yogurts, or the even the meat or fish or the pulses. And uh, actually, uh, we don't have any facilities for the uh, anabolic hormones because uh, those uh, anabolic hormones are not available in our country for our use, and those are not supplied from the government. So we can write any uh, medications outside of our supply. But initially, we actually started for the propranol, but uh, due to our change uh, shift to our new hospital, we actually stopped it, and now we are planning to. Uh, go for the proper model. We actually decided in our uh, last week's uh, a, a meeting and we are developing a protocol with our anesthetist because our ICU and age 2 is running by the anesthetist. So they are very keen to start uh, the proper model uh, to control the hypermetabolic state of the patient. So these are the changes we are actually trying to bring in to the reality. So thank you. And uh, lastly, Tandra, can I ask you, do you, uh, what do you use for sugar control? Do you use insulin? Uh, do you use metformin or? Yeah, actually, uh, 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 when uh, there is a problem with the uh, blood sugar, we have the supplies for the insulin. So we actually use the insulins. And uh, if required, we use the metformins. There is no problem. We, both of those things are available in our pro uh, as part of our protocol and to the supply. So use both. And can I ask one last question uh, to you and then maybe to Raja. How often do you weigh your patients following a burn injury? Sorry, I can't. Uh, uh, how often you... do you weigh, weigh, take the patient's weight? How often do you check the patient's weight following a burn injury? Do you have any protocols? Oh. Yeah, actually, uh, the our uh, we have a, a big uh, emergency department we have very recent changes so immediately after uh, admitting we actually with our uh, the waiting time is very short actually within uh, 20 to 30 minutes at least one of our residents senior residents used to rush uh, actually examine the patient and take the necessary steps and when there is a, a massive uh, actually uh, the disaster happens. Uh, it takes some time, but within three hours, uh, we shall try to reach to the uh, uh, hospital emergency to tackle the situation. Actually, uh, in this way, actually, we manage. Our time is very short response time because in our as we are a dedicated uh, burn and plastic surgery hospital. So when and there is uh, the patients are coming in a bigger number. So we used to pull all of our indoor doctors to the emergency department. In this okay. way, we used to manage. Okay. Uh, Raja, can I ask you, do you, do you weigh the patient? Um, uh, and do you have, do you, how often do you do this, please? Uh, to, to check their weight? Sorry. Uh, we weigh our patients, we check them once every week. 
and uh, but the only thing is that uh, many times we are not too sure as to how exactly they are good enough because whether they are the weight is because of the uh, uh, extra amount of fluids or is it uh, is this, uh, is it the dressing and so on so that is the only the concern for us but to be weigh them once every week we, we have a, a weigh machine where we can weigh it along with the stretcher uh nicole and uh natasha if you're there i mean are there any um things that we need to consider when we're weighing the patient often these will have uh, dressing sometimes there's this whole concept of uh, dry weight and wet weight uh, could you help us to understand that a little bit more about what what weight means and what the impact of uh, weight loss is you know what does a 10% 20% 30% weight loss do to a patient um i don't know if nicole's with us but natasha happy to take that one um, so trying to interpret weights, I'm afraid, is a universal problem. It's, it's not even there resource dependent. Even, even in a well-resourced centre, um, we really struggle to interpret what weights we're seeing on these patients. Um, we are fortunate that we have a weighing bridge in our admissions room. So quite often the patient will have a weight before they've had too much fluid resuscitated, resuscitation started. So they're not usually very edematous. Um, certainly if a resuscitation has started in, a, in um, an admitting hospital and they've transferred over, then they've probably, we've already missed the boat. We've, we've, the weight would very much be a guess, um, to be honest. Um, and you, there used to be the old school uh, belief that perhaps if you waited and weighed at, a, at day 14, it would be a dry weight. But I think that's, that's not the case. You know, we have such a fluctuating fluid status throughout the intensive care stay that you could probably never pinpoint a time where that patient is dry and that patient isn't. Um, I think the nurse's eye becomes a really, really valuable tool. These are the ones that get to see the patients during their dressing changes without the dressings on and can give you a sort of visual description as to where the edema is up to, if it's you know just the lower limbs, if it's all the way up, um, what extent the edema might be, whether or not it's more or less than the last dressing change. Um, we tend to try to weigh our patients each time they have a shower because they can be they come off the bed and then the bed can be zeroed. Um, and nurses are really good at um, giving us a bit of a, an idea as to whether or not they had any dressings on, if the dressings were dry, if they had big wet bolsters on. Um, and then we sort of feed all that information in and make a bit of a guess, to be honest. Um, the implications of weight loss, um, I think uh, Professor Mark's presentation was, was very, very good. It spoke about um, the implications becoming much more dire as the extent of the weight loss increases. So even sort of less than 10%, you're still gonna have some impaired wound healing, greater incidence of infection. Um, you're gonna have a loss of muscle mass and a sort of reduction in physical function there, thereafter. When the weight loss becomes extreme, so sort of a 40% mark, actually it's associated with, with incredibly high mortality. So if you have um, a really uncontrolled weight loss, you're potentially looking at a, what could have been a survivable burn surface area now becoming an unsurvivable patient. So it's certainly something that needs to have a, a, a very high priority with the intensive care patients in these big burns. Um, Sarah and I possess some unpublished data that actually found a um, really strong correlation between weight loss and worse functional, um, uh, functional independence um, at the point that the patient becomes uh, dischargeable from hospital. They, they have a poorer physical um, independence and they've often required uh, more uh, supported living discharge locations if they had a significant weight loss while they're in hospital during their, their acute stage with us. Um, so, yeah, it's not just their survivability, it's a cost to the community thereafter, um, even in the survivors, if we haven't managed the weight loss well early on. Well, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for that, Natasha. I think you're absolutely right in, 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 in everything you've shared there. Uh, Jorge, I think you're going to uh, come in with some thoughts. Yes. Okay. Um, 
before before we wrap uh, the meeting, I'd like to ask just a, a final question briefly to Joe and, and to Bill. We have spoken about the need to control temperature because this is a limiting factor in order to perform surgical excision. As we know, hypothermia together with uh, acidosis and hypovolemia kills these patients and a stop based sample as the clotting cascade specifically a factor 10 conversion from working pro um, Joseph, uh, from the point of view of anesthesia and intensive care bill, from the point of view of surgery, can you give us basically a, a couple of bullet points useful to take forward in order to effectively address the effect of, the, of hypothermia and uh, um, hypermetabolism? Thanks. Sure. Uh, it's, it's all right. I'll, I'll go first. I, I think uh, very importantly, it starts at the beginning and we try to use uh, warm fluids during resuscitation or a level one infusion infuser that could actually warm the fluids as they're going in. Uh, also, when we're sending for other tests to make sure that the patient is well covered and does not get uh, too cold during that time frame. Um, not only do we try to warm the rooms, but we also have heat lamps and heat panels in our ICU. And our ORs are usually on the cooler side. So, and I'm not always in the same operating room. So the team knows when they schedule me in a certain room, I start in the morning and they will usually start warming the room the night before. So by the time we get into the operating room, it, it is a normal temperature. And ju just one other quick thing too, with, with the, the, the feeds, I will place a feeding tube kind of early because I feel even when we get the tube out there, the breathing tube, they're not going to eat enough. And we continue that through the rehab also. But um, that's what we do to keep our patients warm. Final right. thoughts? Um, well, I, I think patients get cold often when they've, uh, they're being um, uh, sent to us. So the actual transfer from other hospitals, secondary transfers, and it's important to uh, realize that actually um, advice for people that are transferring um, patients in to try and prevent that as much as possible. Um, uh, similar to Bill, we use um, uh, ICU rooms with their own individual um, environment, uh, which is, is, is relatively um, warm and um, with uh, a good level of humid, uh, humidity as well to prevent um, evaporative losses. Um, we do tend to um, uh, actively uh, heat patients up with um, warm air blowers if they in the rooms if they get um, uh, too cold. Um, when it comes to surgery, um, we make sure that they're actually at a decent level of um, temperature before we'd even um, consider going into the operating room. Um, in centigrade for us, it's usually um, above uh, 36 um, degrees before we would even start. And it also actually helps if your operating room um, is in fairly close proximity um, to to your uh, intensive care units and burn, burns units as well. Um, our um, uh, the temperature in our um, burns OR is is in the region of around about uh, or at the very least twenty eight degrees um, centigrade um, before we would uh, even even start uh, a major burn um, excision and burn case. Um, and I think also there has to be some dialogue between the anesthesiologists and the surgeons as well um, throughout the case because in, invariably it will cool down. Um, and once you get to around about sort of below thirty five and a half degrees centigrade great it's probably time to wrap up for the day and um and go back to the the, the icu room and and, and uh, kind of do things another day thank you very much uh, joseph uh, at this stage uh, four minutes before four o'clock in, in the uk uh the best thing that i can say is that i have learned a lot myself i have learned a lot from uh each and every one from my colleagues. I think that we have learned from the importance of multidisciplinary involvement in order to address hypermetabolism. I'd like to uh, extend uh, an immense, my immense gratitude to uh, Professor Jeschke, who 
has delivered a fantastic lecture and to every single one of my colleagues and, and panelists. And at this stage, uh, also thank uh, the support of my co-chair, Oran Shelley, uh, my colleagues Nadim Kwaja and Stuart Watson for their support. And I'd like to pass the button to my co-chair, Oran Shelley, for final thought. Oran. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jorge. I mean, I think it's been a very stimulating program that uh, you've put together. I think uh, some wonderful talk at the very start. I think. Uh, important to emphasize the way that this, these cases have been structured to look at the non-pharmacological uh, ways that we can address um, uh, the hypermetabolic states, as well as the pharmacological ways that we can address this. We heard at the very start from Professor Jeske, who spoke to us of the certain uh, in, uh, inflammatory process that uh, happen following uh, burn injury. Uh, the, the catecholamines, the adrenocortical axis, and so forth changes which drive this. And the means which this can be addressed by and attenuated by controlling the ambient temperature. Uh, the importance of early exercise to protect uh, muscle. Uh, early surgical excision of the wound as early as is possible once the patient is stable. And he also showed us how uh, the pharmacological agents of uh, insulin and metformin uh, to provide to ensure there's adequate nutrition uh, with the sugar control, the use of anabolic steroids where the principal role is to protect against excessive muscle breakdown and to facilitate uh, muscle recovery, um, and other agents such as propranolol, which are very effective to reduce the inflammatory process and reduce the number of septic complications. So I think we've really learned a lot. We've uh, discussed it across the whole of the MDT. Uh, the important role of nutrition, early mobilization, and uh, nursing care uh, to look after and combine all aspects of this uh, with uh, safe surgery, uh, always with good communication between the team, the anesthetists, the surgeons, nurses, nutritionists, physios, etc. So thank you from myself uh, to everybody for participating. And I, Jorge, I don't know if you'd like to thank anybody else. I'd like to thank definitely our audience um, for um, staying with us in uh, uh, a part of Burns management, which I think always requires a tiny bit of attention to detail. And that is widely um, somehow uh, mismanaged uh, throughout. I'd like uh, um, to uh, send my gratitude to each and every single one of my panelists, Natasha Kershaw, Bill Hughes, Joe Hassey, Tamvir Ahmed, Raja Sabrabathi, Sarah Smiles, uh, and Nico Lee. I'd like to thank Professor Jeshki for his participation and my co-chairs, uh, Oren Shelley and colleagues, Nadine Kwaja and Stuart Watson. Hope to see you all soon. Thank you very much and have a nice day.